Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to welcome you to the first webinar in our Key Learnings from COVID-19 series, which will feature various members of the Leadership Development Group, so TLD Group, esteemed faculty. Today's inaugural webinar, Lessons Gleaned to Date to Inspire Healthcare Transformations, is being presented by TLD Group Advisory Board member and lecturer, Dr. Ken Bottles of Thomas Jefferson University College of Population Health. As many of you know, TLD Group is a global talent development consulting firm that develops leaders and teams to execute strategy within their organizations, within their sector, and across the health ecosystem, which we define as providers, payers, and pharmaceutical companies. Our health industry focus has enabled us to attract a highly experienced faculty with deep expertise in the sectors we serve. Our fac faculty of over 400 executive and physician coaches OD consultants, academicians, and thought leaders serve our clients across the globe. Next slide, please. We work with organizations to align their talent to business strategies through our four solutions, assessment and coaching, consulting, leadership development programs, and speaking engagements. I'm now going to hand the mic over to TLD Group's founder and CEO, Tracy Duberman, to tell you a little bit about our health ecosystem leadership model, HELM, the research behind it, and its tie to today's topic on healthcare transformation. So Tracy, over to you. Thank you, Tara, and thank you, Lisa, very much. We are thrilled with a large turnout today, which we believe is proof that during a time of crisis like we are in now, connection is key and knowledge creates power. And leadership doesn't just matter more, it matters exponentially more. When we conducted our research to understand how leaders generate solutions to the health industry's most pressing needs, the term COVID-19 was non-existent. Who knew that it would change the face of healthcare for the future? But this is a critical leadership test at all levels. At now, our Helm leadership model, which provides a framework for how leaders cultivate cross-sector partnership to transform health has taken on a more important meaning. The leaders we will re remember from this crisis are those who, as Dove Seidman, who is the founder and chair of the ethics and compliance company, LRN, and have the Institute for Society, so well articulated can inspire trust, hope, and humility. Today, more than ever, we need leaders who can inspire collaboration, common purpose, and future ca capabilities by envisioning a new future, aligning diverse stakeholders, managing boundaries and obstacles, and continuously acting and learning. My co-author and I, Bob Sachs, welcome you to learn how from industry leaders who have mastered the art of cross-sector partnerships, detailed in our book, published by Health Administration Press, available through our organization and Amazon. As we all know, the critical role of social determinants for the health of communities has become widely recognized. Now, COVID-19 has put a bright spotlight on the importance of factors like food supply, income inequality, housing, and public health in our health ecosystem that impact health. Once we overcome our current health crisis, we have the opportunity to continue to attend to these elements, and it will be up to the leaders in healthcare to continue to work closely with their counterparts across the ecosystem to support health. There are many lessons to be gleaned from this current crisis that will no doubt inspire healthcare transformation. And in just a few moments, we'll hear about such transformations from today's speaker, Dr. Ken Bottles. Next slide. But first, a quick mention, our next webinar in our key learnings from COVID-19, that of Larry McAvoy, who will be presenting Time to Get Strategic About Resilience on May 27th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I also want to bring your attention to our Crisis Leadership Support Center, which features our new adapted solutions, including one-on-one -on -one on demand coaching, virtual team and group development, and consultation with experts like Dr. Bottles, which are available during expanded hours, 100% virtually, and on demand. So be sure to keep a lookout for a follow-up email after today's webinar, which will include links to not only the webinar itself, but to these resources. So now on to our featured speaker. Next slide, Kent. 
Today, it is with great pleasure that I introduce our timely webinar on key learnings from COVID-19, lessons gleaned to date to inspire healthcare transformations, presented by our advisory board member, friend and lecturer, Dr. Kent Bottles. Kent is an established physician executive keynote speaker, a consultant and thought leader in healthcare. He has held numerous physician executive positions in academia, biotech, health systems and health plans, giving him a unique perspective for being able to view the current challenges of healthcare transformation through multiple lenses. And now without further ado, I hand the mic over to Kent. Thank you, Tracy. Um, this is the agenda for the webinar, and today's talk is both dense and long. So I'd like to start by thanking my wife, my son, and my daughter for forcing me kicking and screaming to provide you with a roadmap, and here it is. This was uh, yesterday when we went a run through, and you can see a Zoom um, trial run, and you can see that all of my family are befuddled and want me to be more clear and more organized. <laughs> So, so you'll see this roadmap again several times. We're going to start with an overview of where we are today on April 29th. And that's important because it's really changing rapidly. In fact, there's some things that happened today we have to talk about. Then we'll talk about social distancing, where it came from, then healthcare in the future, talking about the road to recovery and revision, how technology is going to change medicine, and the failure of American healthcare economics. It's certainly true that the pandemic has revealed that there's some long-standing structural problems with how we pay for healthcare. Then we have to go back and say, what does history teach us? Because pandemics, it's not our first pandemic, and pandemics cause large, unexpected changes. And I think we're gonna see that. I'm not sure we can predict all of them, but I think we're gonna see some surprising changes, both in healthcare and in the economy. Because healthcare is part of a larger economy, we're gonna have to also talk about what does it mean for the economy, society, and politics? Again, pandemics tend to be change agents, and after pandemics, there tends to be large transformations. Uh, not only does the pandemic show frailties in the healthcare system, it's also showing frailties in the economy itself, and geopolitics may change because of the pandemic. We'll wind up with how do we prevent the next pandemic, and in a conclusion, give you some uh, references of people to follow to uh, stay abreast of this rapidly changing pandemic. So here's the coronavirus here. The coronavirus um, is important to differentiate between the virus and the disease. SARS-CoV-2 is the virus. COVID-19 is the disease caused by the virus, and it stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. The picture of the virus itself shows the red spike proteins, which are important for infectivity and for getting into the human cell. So coronaviruses are a large group of viruses um, that can cause the common cold, croup, and pneumonia. They've been around humans for over a thousand years. They circulate among camels, cats, and most importantly, bats and animals. And in farm country, they cause diarrhea in cows and pigs and upper respiratory disease in chickens. It's not an accident that one of the most famous basic scientists of coronavirus is Dr. Stanley Perlman at the University of Iowa. Bats are mammals that harbor over 500 coronaviruses, but they don't seem to bother the bats at all because the bats, now the bats are mammals just like us, but the bats have an immune system that seems to allow the bats to coexist with these 500 coronaviruses. So for a long time, they caused the cold, sometimes croup, but in 2002, there was a huge epidemic of SARS, and that's SARS-CoV-1, which is what is very genetically similar to the one causing the current pandemic. But in 2002, this novel coronavirus jumped from bats to civet cats and then to humans, and it had a 10% mortality rate. Then in 2012, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, a bat coronavirus jumped to camels, infected camels, and then camels infected people, mostly in Saudi Arabia. And that was important in 2012 because it had a 35% mortality rate. And coincidentally, one person traveled from Saudi Arabia to Korea, and we're going to revisit that because that's important as we talk about why Korea has been so successful 
in combating the pandemic. Here's the roadmap again. So where we are today on April 29th, and again, it's important that we recognize things are changing rapidly, but let's have an overview. As of today at one o'clock, 1,045,000 Americans have tested positive for the SARS virus. 60,000 Americans have died. Today, as of one o'clock, 3,179,000 people in the world have tested positive and over 220,000 people in the world are dead. Now, it's also important to recognize that these numbers are definitely underestimates. And that's because we're now starting to see just in the last few days, some excess death studies come out. One study from Yale a couple days ago showed that between March and April 4th, there were 8,000 COVID deaths in the United States, but 15,000 de excess deaths from the historical patterns. Now, some of this is because some people are dying in nursing homes and in prisons and are not being counted. Some people are dying at home and not being counted. And some people are dying because they're having a heart attack and don't go to the ER because they're afraid of becoming infected. There was another study of excess deaths that just came out that said 27,000 New Yorkers have died since March. That's six times the normal level. And this is thousands more than captured in the COVID statistics. So we definitely know that these um, the statistics, as bad as they are, are really underestimates. So the pandemic started in China when a new coronavirus leaped from bats to an intermediate host and we're not really sure what that intermediate host is yet, and then to humans in Wuhan, China. Genetic analysis shows that the first human was infected in late November 2019. In 60 days, this infection has gone all around the globe, and almost every country has at least some cases. The first community spread in the United States was diagnosed in Washington State on January 19th. And that's kind of interesting about what happened there, because Alex Grinning, who's a virologist at University of Washington, used samples from suspected flu cases and a homemade SARS-CoV-2 test to identify a case near Seattle. He was surprised when it came back positive, but the FDA refused to let him use his test and it took 43 days to get FDA approval. And that's one of the things that we probably have to fix if going forward. The first person in the United States to die of COVID probably died on February 6th in California. And that's a retrospective diagnosis. They looked at an autopsy of a woman who died February 6th of a heart attack. And because there were some suspicious things about it, the coroner submitted um, samples to the CDC and it came back that she had a uh, coronary virus, uh, coronavirus. This is long before anybody thought that it was, uh, it, so community spread was happening long before the travel ban and anything else. The US response has been slow and we really squandered the month of February before taking it seriously. And, and that's been a problem. Um, in a New Yorker article that just came out, a former high ranking CDC, CDC official uh, was quoted the saying, quote, we could have saved so many more lives. We have the best public health agency in the world and we know how to persuade people to do what they need to do Instead, we're ignoring everything we've learned over the last century. The United States was unprepared for provider capacity, both doctors and hospital beds, for PPEs to protect the hospital uh, workers, for ventilators, drugs, testing, contact tracing, and quarantine procedures. We're really in the end of the beginning. So if this was a nine inning baseball game, we're in the first inning. And I think we have to keep that in mind. I think there's a lot to be optimistic about, but I think we have to be understanding it's not gonna go away, any, away anytime soon. We don't know how many people are infected in America because we haven't done widespread testing, but the best estimate is about 10%. If that's true, then 300 million Americans are still vulnerable because none of us have immunity to this new novel coronavirus that came from bats. There really is no treatment available. Antivirals have a bad track record and they'd be most helpful early on. And as we'll see, patients are spreading the disease when they have no symptoms at all or haven't developed symptoms. And so even if remdesivir, which there's one uh, thing came out today saying that there may be helpful, so that today maybe remdesivir should be used as an emergency use authorization by the FDA. But the same day that that came out, which was today, there was an, uh, uh, came out in Lancet that a rather large uh, study of remdesivir in China 
did not show that it was helpful. So again, we don't know whether we have an antiviral. We will only exit this immediate crisis when either herd immunity is achieved, and that means more than 70% of Americans get infected, or a vaccine arrives. Now, we don't even know if you get immunity from getting this new disease. We, have, we think it probably does. We don't know how long it would last, and we really don't know if it even works. So the pandemic, in my estimation, will probably last at least 18 months. There'll be some social distancing for at least 18 months. Now, we could get lucky, and there's some people saying that the vaccine is, is proceeding faster than we thought. Maybe we'll get lucky with an antiviral, but I think we have to plan for the worst, even though we're hoping we get lucky and get some relief. So back to the roadmap, how does COVID-19 spread? This is a chart from Tomas Puyo, who if you don't know who he is, you're gonna find out about him. He's brilliant. And he's written a five, six part blog things about this. And you're gonna see several graphs from him. But here's the approximation of countries along what he calls the hammer and the dance. So if you look at the red, uh, the red uh, thing that goes straight up, that's the exponential growth of the disease in any country that does nothing. And you can see Sweden is on this, this high rise up there. Sweden's interesting because they have done, been much more lax and have not shut down their economy. So if you look at here on the plateau of the green, you see the United States and the UK, Netherlands, it looks like we're actually plateauing out. And that's probably because social distancing is working. And that's the hammer. The evolution of how countries react to the pandemic has been described by Tomas Puyo as a hammer and a dance. The hammer is how we react to the exponential growth of the disease and can range from China's very draconian shutting all, everything down in Wuhan. You couldn't go out, you couldn't get into Wuhan, you couldn't leave your house. To Sweden's relatively lax measures, to South Korea's extensively testing and contact tracing without any economic shutdown at all. And if you'll see, South Korea is doing really well, and that's interesting. So the hammer is how you get across from the first surge, which we're just now plateauing out, we think, in New York City. And the dance then is on the right-hand side of this graph where Australia, China, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan are. And that's because as you lessen up the social distancing and shutdown of your economy, people are gonna get infected and you're gonna have small, hopefully small surges as you have to titrate how you um, treat people and stop the spread. So you have a, a hammer, which is the initial response, which has been quite dramatic in the United States and quite dramatic in China and, and really upsetting for our economy. And then you have the dance as you try to get back to relative normal, but you have to be on the, aware of there's gonna be spikes that come as you lessen up these things. So the dance is how the country handles the inevitable surges of disease that occur when the initial response is over. Now, we just said Sweden didn't do much in terms of social distancing or hammering this infection. And a study just came out yesterday, which says that Sweden has 35% excess deaths compared to usual, compared to Denmark, which did do social distancing, which had only 6%, which seems to say the social distancing probably does work. Another chart from Tomas Puyo, uh, we'll look mostly at the, the red circle, and in the lower left-hand corner, there's a green circle. Some countries have done really much better than other countries in handling this pandemic. New Zealand, Australia, South Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Vietnam have all uh, done a lot of testing and have been able to control the outbreak. I was actually in New Zealand when the outbreak first started, and I can tell you they shut down the entire country and had very stringent social distancing. What this chart also shows that the developed countries that have controlled the epidemic in the lower left-hand corner in the green, the green circle have only about 3% positives when they test for coronavirus. Now that's the test to actually identify the RNA in the virus. That's the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction test that actually identifies the viral particles, the viral DNA. The red circle in the middle of the chart is where we are. And those are countries that were overwhelmed with cases. They have a high rate of positive tests, 
they don't have enough tests to do every to do the testing they should do to control the hammering of the pandemic. It's interesting if you look at the just for a second, if you look at the blue circle, Iceland is alone here. They did a great job of testing. Iceland's had lots of cases. Either Iceland is the only country that's not lying about their statistics, or they're much better at testing than at controlling the epidemic. So we're going to talk about testing quite a bit, but this is where we are today. How does it spread? One of the reasons it's so deadly and so disruptive is that 45% of people are spreading the disease before they have any symptoms. That's the blue hump right there, pre-symptomatic. When people do get symptoms, they also spread the disease. Um, and some asymptomatic people spread the disease. The environmental is whether you pick it up on surfaces. So you can see that's probably not the major way that it spreads. But this pre-symptomatic spread of the disease is really a problem because how do you control a disease if you don't even know you have it? And it's, this is probably why this has been so much worse than SARS or MERS. Remember, SARS had a 10% mortality rate and MERS had a 35% mortality rate, those diseases burnt out because they killed people so quickly. You didn't have this pre-symptomatic spread. And remember, viruses aren't really living things. They need us to live. The virus takes over our machinery in our cells to replicate the virus. So th this is really important that the virus spreads before you have symptoms. Here's another slide from Tomas Puyo, which shows um, a restaurant in Guangzhou. And if you look at table A on the right, there's A1, and that's a person that just left Wuhan where the, the pandemic started and took his family at table A out to lunch. And you can see that he infected one, two, three, four people in his family at table A, two people at table C who were not in his family, and three people at table B. And if you look far over on the right, you'll see an air conditioner with arrows. This just gives you a clue of how it spreads and why you really don't wanna be going out to crowded restaurants because he was asymptomatic and this is how it spread in Guangzhou. Now, this is from the New York Times. So on March 1st, we had only 23 confirmed cases of coronavirus in the United States. And if you look at that little black circle at the top, only one of those was in Boston and only one of those, the, the little blue thing at the lower right-hand corner of the black dot, was in New York City. So the United States, in five major cities, we had 23 confirmed cases. But according to the Northeastern model, now all these models have pluses and minuses about how good they are. But according to this model, at that time on March 1st, in the United States, there were 28,000 infections in these five cities. Boston had 2,300. Seattle had 2,300, Chicago had 3,300, and there's so many infections, it doesn't fit on one slide. Chicago had 3,300, San Francisco had 9,300, and New York City already had 10,700 active cases, even though only one had been confirmed by a test. So it really shows that the horse was out of the barn a lot sooner than we thought. And that's one of the big problems of why we have 60,000 Americans dead as of today. As COVID spreads, it's shown an exacerbated long-standing pre-existing inequality based on age, race, gender, location, and access in the United States. This is really, really important because we can't just go back to normal. We have to learn from this pandemic. We have to do better. We have to change the structural problems in our healthcare system that this is exacerbating. It's quite clear that elderly people, people of color, men, and marginalized communities and urban areas are affected the most. Children can get infected. Some children have died, very few. It's mostly a disease of elderly, people of color, and men. And it's quite clear from the statistics I shared with you that there's three million cases in the world and we have over a million here. The United States is clearly the global epicenter of this pandemic right now. And yet we have, if you follow the news at all, we have a lot of tension between social distancing to avoid the infection. Remember, social distancing is the only tool we have right now to stop the spread, and it seems to be working, and the problem of shutting down the economy. That's not to say, as a public health person, that shutting down the economy is trivial. It's not. 
26.5 million Americans have filed for unemployment in the last five weeks. That's 26.5 million Americans who've lost their jobs. That's 26.5 million Americans, most of whom have lost their health care insurance because health care insurance in the United States is usually linked to employment. So this is something that I want to emphasize. We can't just recover. We have to do better than recover. We have to fix some of the problems that the pandemic shows are occurring. Another Thomas Puyo slide, because of all this tension about should we be opening up, should we be going to beaches, should we be going to restaurants, um, I think in general, we are opening up too soon. And I think that this is a study from the 1918 Spanish flu um, that shows that uh, social distancing not only helps control the epidemic, it may actually help us, the economy, come back. In this case, the, the green dots are cities that had measures in force, social distancing, wearing a mask, um, for more days than the average city during the 1918 pandemic of the flu. The red dots are cities with measures in force for fewer days, so they didn't do it. Famously, Philadelphia had a parade, that's where I am, and it was terrible. Um, and St. Louis did not have a parade, they canceled their parade, and they did better. So on the horizontal axis is mortality, and on the vertical axis is change in employment, so getting jobs back after the pandemic was over. And you can see that you'd rather be in Seattle, Oakland, Portland, Omaha, or Los Angeles, which not only did better and having fewer deaths, but they, their economy bounced back quicker as measured by change in employment. So this is one natural experiment which seems to indicate that there maybe shouldn't be so much tension between the social distancing and hoping to rebound the economy. So back to the roadmap, social distancing. We, you've heard a lot about it. Some people say it's better described as physical distancing, but let's take a look at that. Physical distancing has been practiced in pandemics since the Middle Ages and probably before, but it only became social policy uh, in the United States, official policy, in 2007. And the story behind that was outlined in a New York Times article where George W. Bush, the president at the time, read the book about the 1918 flu called The Great Influenza. And in a speech, he said, a pandemic is a lot like a forest fire. If caught early, it might be extinguished with limited damage. If allowed to smolder, it can turn into an inferno. He was very concerned about planning for the inevitable pandemic that we're now suffering through. And so he, um, the White House decided to uh, deputized Dr. Richard Hatchett and Carter Metcher to come up with policies to combat the upcoming pandemic. They came up with the idea of social distancing, and nobody liked it. People in the White House, people at the CDC, people at HHS often said, according to the article, shut the F up, that they just didn't think this was going to work. But it was adopted in 2007 as non pharmaceutical interventions. Now, what's interesting is that Robert Glass is a scientist at the Sandia um, Labs in Albuquerque, um, and his 14-year-old daughter, Laura, was doing a science fair experiment about social networking using her classroom as an example. Because the White House had contacted Glass, he said, huh, maybe I can actually use my daughter's science fair project. And he had access to the supercomputers at Sandia Labs, and he built a model of flu spread in a city of 10,000 people. And what they showed was if the schools closed early, 500 people got the flu. If the schools closed late or didn't close at all, 5,000 people got the flu. This is the idea that social distancing, even a few days or weeks, can make a big difference in who gets the flu or who gets the pandemic disease. That's because of the exponential growth curve, that red line going straight up that Sweden is on um, that we saw in the previous slide. And here's the article they wrote. And if you look at the second author, it's Laura Glass. And if you look at where her office is, it's the Albuquerque Public High School in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So the father got the first authorship, but the 14-year-old the daughter already had a, um, an article published in Emerging Infectious Diseases, Targeted Social Distancing Designs for Pandemic Influenza. And here's the article that uh, Richard Hatchett, Carter Metcher, and Mark Lipsick um, published that is the article most people refer to. Richard Hatchett, we're going to come back to 
because he, he actually runs an NGO that has been warning us for years that we should be doing more developed vaccines and drugs against pandemics. And Mark Lipschitz is someone you've probably seen on TV. He's one of the most famous epidemiologists at Harvard, and he's uh, often been advising, uh, seems like everyone, on how to deal with this uh, pandemic. So back to the roadmap. We're now gonna talk about healthcare in the future. So we wanna talk about the road to recovery, but also the road to revision. And when I say the road to recovery and revision, what I'm talking about is we don't wanna just recover, we want to learn from our mistakes, learn from what the pandemic has to teach us, and do better, both in the economy and in healthcare. So um, the actual, the president's uh, coronavirus task force has come up with a phased road to recovery, which is actually science-driven and quite good. They have a staggered approach to reopening the economy. You would need widespread testing, surveillance, and contact tracing with quarantine of contacts. You would need treatment, although we don't have one. Hopefully, remdesivir will be a good treatment. But remembering that unless the treatment is prophylactic, it won't stop the spread. We definitely need more adequate resources, PPE, for doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists, and hospitals. Um, it really has been tragic that we've actually sent many of our physicians and nurses and other um, uh, professionals uh, in without, without really adequate resources. And obviously, the best thing would be to get an effective vaccine. This is back to Tomas Puyo, uh, priorities in testing. And this is just an illustrative thing. On the left-hand side in the red, the fewer tests you have, the more selective you are with whom you test, and the higher the positive rate you will have. So if you look on the right, if you only test people with strong symptoms or symptoms, then you'll get a lot of positive tests. If you had more tests, you could test maybe all contacts or all people or everybody. And so the higher priority people to be tested, the higher likelihood of finding positives. But if you remember back that slide we showed before, if you look at South Korea or Vietnam or New Zealand, they tested so many people that their positive rates were only about three to 4%. And those are much different than our positive rates. Now, we also said that what you really need to do, and when you, when you get through with the hammer, with taking care of the initial surge, you need to get the economy going again. But what you need to do is do that by identifying people that have the disease early on and then finding their contacts and tracing them. Now, I mentioned earlier that in South Korea, one person traveled from Saudi Arabia in 2012, and there was an outbreak of MERS, which is that other coronavirus disease that had a mortality rate of 35%. That really got the South Koreans' attention. And they put into place, knowing that another pandemic would come, a really sophisticated way to do contact tracing. So here's the South Korean approach. If you look in the middle of this slide, Bob in red got infected. So the green, uh, excuse me, the blue dots are identified through interviews with Bob by a contact tracer. You talk to Bob, you talk to his family, you talk to his doctor, and you can see all the little blue things we identified by doing that. Some coworkers, a couple of friends they actually saw in the grocery store yesterday, and a couple of friends that they actually had dinner with. Now, what they do in South Korea is, if you look at the green boxes, those are all locations that they identified by tapping into the GPS on Bob's cell phone, his credit card uh, records, and it's the closed circuit TV data. So they're able to identify all the green dots, a lot more people that Bob came into contact with just before, in the two weeks before he got the disease. So you see that this is not just contact tracing in terms of calling up a few people. This is using digital methods on the cell phone GPS, on credit card records, and even on CCTV data to identify as many people as possible that Bob came into contact with over the last few days, because he might have infected them. One of the first patients to be diagnosed in Seattle came from Wuhan. It was a tech worker who visited his family in Wuhan, came back to Seattle in January, tested positive, and by just not using this sophisticated contact tracing, but by calling around, they identified 68 people that that person had been in contact with since he landed at SeaTac. 
which is the airport in Seattle, the driver who drove him from the airport, his coworkers that he met at work the next day, people he met in the grocery store when he went shopping because he'd just come back from a trip. So this is really, really important if you're gonna do the dance of controlling the second uh, tertiary surges of the pandemic, you have to be able to do this sophisticated contact tracing. And it's, it's worth mentioning that Korea, which did it so well, Korea never, South Korea did not have a huge spike in deaths and they did not close down their economy. They were just so efficient at finding people who were infected, having so many tests. And here's what you do, testing, contact tracing, isolations and quarantine. So in the upper left-hand box, the red thing is the first person who is positive. You then find out through contact tracing through the credit cards and this CCTV and there's uh, GPS and from telephone interviews who they might have infected. The lower left-hand box, two of his contacts got infected. So the person that got infected and the contacts that are infected immediately are put in isolation. They don't go home. They're put in a government place, usually a hotel room, um, where they're isolated. But what they do in, in the, the nations that have done a really good job of controlling the pandemic is just the, the casual contacts of that person are quarantined. I have a relative that lives in Hong Kong. And last month he answered his apartment door and the police were there. And they let, he, they let him get his cell phone. They took him and made him be quarantined for 12 days until his test came back negative. His test did come back negative, so that was good. But again, this is the kind of testing, contact tracing, isolations that will allow you to do the dance and control the secondary surges as you try to reopen the economy. So the road to recovery, we really don't know the true fatality rate. We don't really know how many of those people are silent carriers. The CDC has estimated 25%. You just saw a slide that estimated 40%. In Iceland, where they've done a lot of testing, they said it was 50%. And in China, they said it was 60%. We've already know that at least 300 million Americans have not been infected yet. So when we open up the economy, we are going to have a lot more people get infected. And because death is a lagging indicator, three weeks later, there'll be more deaths. So basically, the tighter the restrictions on social distancing, the fewer the deaths, and the longer the period of time between surges. So you really wanna do that. I live in Montgomery County uh, near Philadelphia, and we're lucky enough to have a co county commissioner who's a physician, Dr. Valor Kush. It was just reported in the Philadelphia newspaper today that she insisted on, on testing all of the prisoners in the Montgomery County Jail. There were 948 prisoners that were tested. I have 177 are positive, for COVID-19 and 171 are positive and have no symptoms whatsoever. Again, showing how difficult it is to control the spread of this disease when they don't even have any symptoms. And also recognize that jails and nursing homes are special places that are petri dishes for this and have really been a problem and have a lot of the deaths that we're having in the United States. China, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, all got through the initial uh, peaks of coronavirus, some quite successfully, but all have experienced secondary surges after the first lockdowns has been eased. And here's another Tomas Puyo uh, graph, which on the left-hand side is February 15th, all the way to the right is April 19th, so it's about a month. And you can see China in the red went down and then had a, speak, a, 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 a peak. South Korea is showing in the blue a large uh, peak that they had to then control with more testing and more isolation and more contact tracing. Japan showing a, a peak. And Singapore did a great job in the initial infections. And then because a lot of people fly into Singapore, they've just recently, in the middle of April, had a large peak. So this is the dance. This is why you have to titrate reopening the economy because more people are gonna get infected more people are then gonna get sick and you really don't want to overload and um, overwhelm your hospitals and ICUs like we almost did, like we did in New York City. So the, the president's um, guidelines are that we shouldn't reopen until there's declining cases for 14 days. 
we then should trace about 90% of contacts. And I've just shown you how sophisticated it is in, in South Korea. Just this week, a bipartisan $46 billion proposal has been put out uh, to Congress, it hasn't been passed yet, to hire 180,000 contact tracers. And they're saying this should be led by Andy Slavik and Scott Gottlieb, two former um, very competent uh, American federal officials. Uh, Gottlieb ran the FDA and as a physician, Slavik ran the, the uh, CMS. Um, the estimates are that we actually need between 100,000 and 300,000 new workers to do the contact tracing because we really don't have a robust system like they have in South Korea. We also would need to end the healthcare worker infections. We also would need to figure out what we're going to do with mild cases, with contacts. In the United States, we've been mostly sending people back home, but one of the lessons from China was that a lot of the spread of the disease in Wuhan was within families. And certainly if you follow CNN, Chris Como got infected probably uh, at work. He then was isolated in the basement and they supposedly did a really nice job of isolation, but his wife and his son have now come down with much uh, less serious diseases than he had. Again, in Asia, where they've done a really good job of this, there are shelters that, are that you have to go to if you're a contact um, to recover. They don't have people recovering at home. Now, there's been a lot of talk about testing. We've talked about the uh, polymerase chain reaction to find the RNA virus itself. That tells you if someone is infected, but there's serological tests, which now look at antibodies, so IgM and IgG, which we said might convey immunity. We, we hope it does. We don't know that for sure yet. So basically, what some people are saying is we be, should be doing serology tests to see who has, maybe they had an asymptomatic uh, bout with uh, COVID-19 and are now safe. They could go back to work. If they were doctors, they could go back to seeing patients if there was immunity, which we don't know for sure yet. But some people in Europe are talking about dividing people into two classes, those who've recovered from the infection and hopefully have immunity, and those who are still vulnerable. Now, one problem with this is the testing for serology, for antibodies, for immunity, is the Wild West, as one expert des described it. The, the FDA has allowed in 136 antibody tests, but they've only vetted four. And so a lot of these tests are turning out to not be very, um, they have a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. Um, it takes a couple of weeks for antibodies if you're going to get them to come up. The investigator we talked about, Dr. Perlman in Iowa, has said it's not just antibodies, it's T cells that are really important in terms of whether or not you um, uh, can, can combat the disease. So uh, the idea that you're going to have a passport that you can, some people are actually talked about having a card that says, I have antibodies, so I can go back to work. I'm not infectious anymore. If indeed we can prove that is a little bit scary in, in a way, um, because you're gonna divide Americans into two classes, those that can work, those that can't work. So that's very controversial. And I think that leads us to our first polling question, which I think someone's gonna nicely read for us. Yes, um, I am launching it now. So what were the what what was the intent, unintended consequence of Cuba's HIV isolation camps with guaranteed income activities and classes? So, so Cuba did a great job of, of of controlling HIV. They had isolation places that people went to when they were positive. Um and they actually got a salary and actually had classes and but what what were some of the unintended consequences of that? which I guess I'm trying to say, would we have unintended consequences if we had immunity cards for COVID? Okay. So you're polling now to see what the group says. Mm -hmm. We'll keep it open for a few seconds more. Well, open, please vote. Just vote once. <laughs> Okay. All right, I'm going to close the poll and share, and share the responses. And what do we got? Um, hold on a second, share. Okay, so it appears that 
everybody, 57% believed that patients uh, were infecting themselves to gain entrance. 21% um, believed that infection of doctors and workers in the camps, and 7% respectively um, believed that there were large-scale protests unusual for Cuba, or there was an increase in the number of AIDS cases in Cuba, or there was censure by the United Nations. And the correct answer is that actually many patients with HIV infected themselves to gain entrance. And so this is kind of a controversial thing right now with the COVID, with the coronavirus, because some young people are saying, hey, let's just get infected and get it over with. And actually, there's been a couple articles saying that we should do like they used to do with chickenpox. Um, I'm not advocating that at all, because one, we don't know if you really do get immunity, and two, it would be terrible if you actually were one of the young people that did that, but then ended up dying of the disease. And there have been some young people who had no risk factors who have died of the disease. So the road to recovery, we're hoping for a vaccine. Now, the record of a vaccine development was a long time ago. It, was, it only took four years to get a mumps vaccine. And remember, we haven't got a vaccine even now to HIV. But the other problem is, is that some of the vaccine candidates against SARS, HIV, and dengue fever triggered an antibody-dependent enhancement, which made recipients more likely to get infected, not less likely. So that would be terrible. So um, getting a vaccine is no easy thing. There's been, we have a lot of really good technology now. There's an Oxford group that thinks it's going really fast. Um, we're hoping we get a vaccine. Anthony Fauci estimates it's going to take a year and a half or 18 months to get a vaccine. Now, even if we got a vaccine that worked perfectly and we got it rather quickly, that's not the end of the story. You have to have hundreds of millions of doses. And the vaccines that we manufacture in the United States, we usually only make about 4 million. If you think about it, there's 300 million Americans who are susceptible to getting infected. You'd have to have at least 300 million doses. And sometimes vaccines require two doses, remember? So that'd be 600 million. That's like would take a long time to produce just enough doses of a vaccine that we develop. So there's actually been some talk of converting distilleries to produce vaccines because they had fermentation vats. We need international cooperation. Uh, WHO is being criticized. Michael Osterholm is at the University of Minnesota and says if we alienate the Chinese with our rhetoric, I think it will come back to bite us. The long shutdowns are increasing domestic abuse, depression, suicide. If the vaccines work, a good thing would be that we now would take science more seriously, and maybe we would actually take climate change more seriously. Um, this is a really interesting article that Siddhartha Mukherjee just uh, published. It hasn't come out yet. It's coming out in May 4th in The New Yorker. And he makes the point I was trying to make before. We shouldn't just recover. We got to do better. Because he writes that COVID-19 is revealing pre-existing weaknesses in our complex web of systems and processes that we call American medicine. Medicine's a delivery system, it's a research program, it's a protocol for quality control, it's a forum for exchange of information between clinicians. What he points out is that we've had a shortage of drugs to put people on the ventilators, we've had a shortage of PPE, but we had shortages of drugs before this pandemic even hit. Uh, we had trouble getting sailing because of the hurricane in Puerto Rico. Res uh, respiratory therapists and pulmonologists have said there's a huge shortage of O2 for patients at home. Then Christine, which is an anti-leukemia um, uh, drug, has been shortages. So our supply lines weren't working great even before the pandemic. We talked about a little bit the, the failed month of February. Part of that was the CDC insisted on having their own test for COVID-19. They sent it out and the test didn't work. It took about a month for them to get a test that did work. We talked a little bit about the FDA response to testing that they were slow to approve the tests in Washington. We also are, some people are criticizing them for allowing 136 serology tests in. And remember, a lot these tests aren't perfect. Even the test for the RNA itself, the polymerase uh, chain reaction, a, a Cleveland Clinic uh, study just showed that there's 15% false negatives. And a Chinese study said there were up to 40% false negatives. So the testing that we have is not perfect. Uh, Professor Susan Weiss is at Penn here, um, and she's spent 40 years studying the basic science of coronavirus. And listening to some of her lectures, she's really brilliant and has uh, identified for me lots of proteins that the virus RNA encodes for. 
And all of those proteins, or most of them, are definitely targets for therapy. But what she says is that she's been studying for coronavirus for 40 years, and it's been really, really hard to get funding. Uh, there was a funding spike a little bit when the SARS epidemic happened in 2002, but as soon as it was over, funding dried up again. And so she says it's really been hard to keep the labs going, and Dr. Perlman at University of Iowa agrees with her. Another problem is, is that our um, EPIC and, and other uh, electronic medical record systems have not been useful in identifying this fast uh, proceeding disease. Just recently, it's been noticed that some young patients are having strokes and emboli from clots, sometimes in their legs, sometimes in their kidneys, sometimes in their hearts. And it's been difficult to, to learn about this because that wasn't one of the first, young people don't usually get uh, serious infections. And two, it's hard to use our electronic medical record to in real time sort of say, can we look at all the, the COVID patients to see how many of them have clots? Uh, and so basically clinicians are using Twitter and Facebook and other informal ways to learn about the disease. And we're now learning that young people are having strokes from uh, this disease. So someone on Twitter, a cardiologist in Boston said, why are all the notes in Epic useless to understand what's happening to my patients? Another guy wrote back on Twitter notes are used to bill, rather than intended purpose, which was to convey our observations, our important work has been co-opted by billing. So in this article that's coming out May 4th in the New Yorker, he says, one of our problems is the market-driven, efficiency-obsessed culture of hospital administration has decreased hospital beds and redundancy um, and things like PPE, so that when the pandemic hit, we weren't ready, and the value of slack and resilience is suddenly realized. And that's why I'm so excited that Larry McAvoy is going to give the next webinar for TLD in May, because this is really important both for the economy and healthcare. We have to like not be so efficient that when an emergency occurs, we can't respond. So what this author says is that we should learn from the weaknesses that this pandemic has shown us, make sure our supply chain for PPE and ventilators has adequate capacity, make sure the CDC can launch tests in days, not months, for new epidemics, make sure the research priorities don't erase the history of basic science that can help us identify proteins that could be used uh, as a drug therapy, make sure the FDA is a checkpoint, not a roadblock to fast testing, and then have a digital medical record that you can use in real time as an aperture to sharing newly discovered knowledge about a rapidly evolving disease. So in general, I think that it, this is sort of a general slide that we'll now dive into. In general, I think the US healthcare system is gonna be shocked. Um, I think some small hospitals will close. We already have some rural hospitals closing. Uh, many independent primary care physicians are worried they're not gonna survive. Definitely telemedicine is gonna thrive. We hope that there's an investment in public health and we'll talk about that at the end. We have to rethink the way that we handle urgent needs for PPE and, and medicines and ventilators. And it may ironically have a push to expand healthcare insurance. If 26.5 million Americans lost their healthcare insurance um, last five weeks, that's kind of a push that it's gonna be hard to survive if you don't have healthcare insurance. So maybe this Medicare for all will become more popular. I think we should try to not be pessimistic. Uh, Zeke Emanuel has said, maybe there's a silver lining, and he identifies three. One is telemedicine. We've identified some stuff we can do from home. My wife is practicing outpatient gynecology in the bedroom next door. We have now have an increased threshold for hospitalizations and accelerating the move of care to the home. Um, and we, could, we could learn a decreased use of ineffective low-value medications, labs, prenatal interventions, and diagnostic and surgical procedures. The National Academy of Science uh, Medicine branch says we have about $200 billion in waste. Now, Emmanuel says we're going to have to have specific policies if we want to do better than we've done in the past, changing the way we reimburse for telemedicine, maybe trying to get some fixed uh, revenue for primary care doctors, uh, maybe having Medicare reassess payments for the top 100 elective procedures to stop overpayments. And his most important thing is that he thinks Medicare payments should be for any service or procedure should be site neutral. Right now in the United States, if you do a bone marrow biopsy in a hospital, you get $2,472. If the same doctor does the same bone marrow biopsy in his office on the same patient, he's reimbursed 
$246. Um, that is interesting. Back to the roadmap. How is technology going to change medicine, telemedicine, and robots? So clearly, telemedicine is going to be the big winner from the use of this pandemic. Um, the hospitals here in Philadelphia um, have really closed down their outpatient clinics and are doing outpatient medicine from home. The use of telemedicine is going to be critical for the management of the pandemic, says this expert at Kaiser. Telemedicine is being rediscovered, says the chief of American Well. And you have a number of platforms, Doctor on Demand. Intermountain is using a Connect Care, which is expanding a measles workflow. Um, there's American Well, Zoom and Care Clinics in Oregon and Washington, Teladoc, MD Live at NYU is doing a lot of telemedicine. This is mostly about England. They're saying basically they've had 10 years of change in one week. We're basically witnessing a, a doctor in England says 10 years of change in one week. It used to be 95% of patient contact was face to face. That's changed completely. They've changed their privacy regulations. Before the pandemic, video appointments were 1% of the National Health Service. Afterwards, it's been up to 100%. In Partners Healthcare in Boston, they had 1,600 video visits in February, 90,000 in March. Some physicians are worried. Here's a physician in England saying it's risky. It's not what we're familiar with. If we're bringing in patients less, we may be seeing more subtle. We may not be seeing more subtle signs of things like cancer. It's all, but we've definitely normalized telehealth, and I don't think we're going to go back. Um, in some ways, I think telehealth could be an improvement. By doing telehealth, you can assess the living environment whether the patient has pets, housing, food, social support. You could have ability for specialists and PCPs to have a joint visit. You could have group visits for education and peer support, and the cost of care should decrease. Now, to actually use it correctly, we would have to have a major investment in connectivity between the home and the office. There are already the ability to do pulmonary connected peak flow meters and oxygen monitors. There are some companies doing exciting things in diabetes and behavioral health. So I think this is one area where the pandemic may improve our ability to provide care. Now, the CMS was quite responsive to this. Medicare has included telehealth for 20 years, but only in rural areas, only on a limited basis. And they've really uh, loosened up these rules. They've lifted geographic and originating site restrictions. Everybody on Medicare now can have access. Uh, you can have telephone access, even if it's the first time you're seeing a patient. Um, the providers can now do E&M over the phone. There's an expanded list of approved services. They've increased payments for Medicare for equal and to inpatient. Not all private insurances have increased payments. Um, and providers are not being penalized for using technologies that are not compliant with HIPAA. In the past, they said that, that telemedicine was too expensive. Now they're saying telemedicine should be used for disease control. A big question is these are temporary easing of the restrictions. Will they become permanent? I would predict they have to be. Another thing, though, we're worried about is that whenever you have a change like this, there's a problem with fraud. Just in September, just before the, the pandemic, the DOJ indicted 35 different people in a $2.1 billion Medicare fraud for telemedicine visits. So we always have to be careful about that. The rural health experience has been good. Um, they've, there's some really excellent uh, things we can learn from the rural health experience, especially in behavioral health. They've done evaluation and diagnosis, case consultations, treatment, medication management, continuing care, and provider education. Um, I've just listed here that you can go back to some really excellent places, the Greater Oregon Behavioral Health, Wyoming Trauma Telehealth, Arrowhead Telepresence Coalition, and the Lutheran Services of North Dakota. There have been some exciting things in behavioral health with telemedicine um, for veterans. And this brings us to polling question two, if someone could read that. Yes. All right. So robots have been used um, in fighting COVID-19 by disinfecting by using drones, patient intake, identification of infected via contact tracing, manufacturing of PPE, or all of the above. So please vote, and then we'll reveal the answer. Okay, we'll give it a few more seconds.
Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Thank you. What's the result? The result is um, all of the above. 92% have said that it's all of the above. What a smart group. That's right. So Hong Kong's been dis disinfecting their subways with robots. China actually has a whole field hospital staffed by robots. In Everett, Washington, they had a robot examine an isolated patient who was quite infected. Um, and here's a report out of Texas A&M about COVID-19 as of April 20th. 16 countries are using it for public safety, like for quarantine enforcement, disinfecting public spaces, public service announcements. Seven are using it for clinical care. Seven are using it for work, critical infrastructure, quality of life, delivering groceries, telecommerce. Five are using it for laboratory supply chain automation and three for non-hospital care. Um, this is a drone being used to disinfect a public space in China. So we're back to the roadmap. Well, what about the failure of American healthcare economics? This may be the most important part. Basically, one of the most important problems we have is that private practice, primary care survival is really at risk. Um, as you know, there's been some rescue funds from the Congress. There was a $2 trillion one, and then just uh, last week, a $484 trillion one. They're not really providing funds for private practice. About half of all physicians work in private practice. So this Alabama practice it had a no-show rate that went from 5% to 75% as they patients were afraid to come in for outpatient visits. Um, this family practice in Asheville, North Carolina has had their visits cut down by half. And they predict if we don't get relief, financial relief in two to three weeks, we'll have to lay off physicians. Now CMS, as we said, has eased regulatory barriers to telephone video visits. Not all private insurers have followed. Insurers in general used to pay 20 to 50% less for virtual visits. And the president of the American Academy of Family Practice has said a lot of our colleagues have dabbled in telemedicine, but they really haven't had the money to put it into their practices. Now they're in an intolerable situation where they have to make this thing happen yesterday. They uh, at the American Academy of Family Practice estimate 60,000 primary care practices will be closed by the end of June. And the American College of Physicians, which is mostly internists, I think, said many primary care practices are in critical condition because I don't think they can survive much longer in the business model we're currently in. The problem has been that they have not been doing preventative care, non-urgent visits, elective surgery, office procedures. They have a catastrophic drop in cash flow. Many of the practices aren't set up for telemedicine. The virtual revenues don't offset the lost revenue. And every time a physician gets laid off, three staff members um, get laid off because they support the physician. And I mean, this is happening, we think it's happening more in small hospitals, but just yesterday I read that the Mayo Clinic is furloughing or cutting salaries of 30,000 employees to try to deal with a $3 billion pandemic loss. And that's 42% of their employees. Stanford Healthcare is uh, offering furloughs or salary cuts to 14,000 employees. So this is not just small practices. The other problems with this is that there's a lag in payments of at least three months so that these practices still have to pay the rent, have to pay the heat, have to pay salaries. They a bunch of things they think that should happen. Jeff Livingston here wrote a nice healthcare blog saying here's some things that have to happen to keep primary care going. I wanted to include that the AMA has a COVID-19 resource center, which has some uh, good advice, I think. Um, they give some advice on the next slide. They have a lot of template letters you can use trying to uh, apply for small business grants, trying to um, consolidate administrative resources so that the AMA has got some resources that can be helpful to trying to keep these practices open. It's also been a financial disaster for hospitals. Um, and there's no doubt about that. Most of that is due to that hospitals have cut back on elective surgery and procedures. It turns out that most hospital income now comes from outpatient and elective procedures. And again, this is April 29th, and I just have to say, before I gave the webinar, I happened to glance at the homepage for the New York Times, and there's a banner headline that says, US economy um, shrank at the fastest rate in a decade with the worst yet to come. That it looks like that just today, the Commerce Department said that 
the GDP shrank at a 4.8% annual growth rate in the first quarter. That's the worst since 2008. But maybe more concerningly, that healthcare spending declined 2.3%. And that's directly related to COVID and these hospitals have to take care of COVID patients because they say they're losing $1,200 for each case. It's totally changed the entire financial model for hospitals. Moody's and Fitch ratings have downgraded their outlooks for nonprofit hospitals. I think the smaller community hospitals will be hardest hit, and we're really not sure when we're gonna resume elective cases. And again, there's this dance, this possibility of second, third, and fourth waves of infection. So the other thing that's happening is the pandemic is, in, is endangering the transition from fee-for-service to value-based care. Remember back before the pandemic, we talked about the ACA and accountable care organizations and that what we were doing was shifting from fee-for-service to value-based care. We were trying to get people to uh, accept more risk, but hospitals are now reluctant to put dollars at risk when they wanna recoup all the losses they're having from COVID. And their expenses are up because they had to go out into a marketplace with and really masks that used to cost 50 cents were being sold in the marketplace for seven dollars each and states and hospitals were competing against each other to get mask and ppe um the decrease in office visits is also hitting this and the acos have been uh, surveyed and 60 percent said we're dropping out of risk-based models for accountable care organizations because we don't think that we can afford to go at financial risk so this puts on hold a lot of the initiatives that have been on the value-based side of things. CMS has been trying to, to get people to go to that. Remember, if you went to a value-based um, system that you could avoid the, uh, the uh, grading system for individual doctors. CMS has said that they're gonna uh, stop or pause some reporting requirements. But as one person said, this is not about managing a population. This is about keeping people alive. Coronavirus is really a five alarm fire. Um, also important, I think, is that this is showing some problems with especially community-based hospital governance. Community-based boards are not used to crisis management. They're used to maybe monthly or quarterly meetings. Um, the CEOs that were trying to buy masks and PPE on the open market ran up against that they had only spending authority, some for 500,000, some for a million dollars. And if they, if they had to go back to their board to get permission, they lost out on getting the mask. So the need for quick action, for nimbleness in a pandemic has now had a lot of emergency committees of boards and there's not, we need some more federal guidance on what community hospital boards should be looking like. Also insurance costs, they're gonna go up. Um, some people say as much as 40% next year. Plans in 2021 will price not only to cover losses, but to cover anticipated costs. Companies are talking about dropping insurance coverage. We've already talked about 26.5 uh, million Americans have filed for unemployment. Those companies did not want to continue to pay health care insurance if they furloughed them. Uh, it's estimated that testing costs may be as much as $8.4 billion and treatment costs $95 billion. Again, Fitch has rated insurance companies from stable to negative. Um, Covered California has said it's gonna cost commercial insurers between 34 billion and $251 billion. So insurance companies are gonna be hit. And here's a slide that I think is scary, at least to me. If you look at this slide of uh, estimated impact to health insurance coverage due to the pandemic, before the pandemic, we had an unemployment rate of 3%. 71 million Americans got their health care insurance from Medicaid, 13 million or so got it at the ACA marketplaces, and 163 million Americans got their insurance from where they worked. The uninsured in America was 29 million, had gone up a little bit um, under the new administration. Right now, the economist for the White House has estimated that unemployment rate will hit the same rate that it was in the Great Depression, which is about 25%. So if that happens, as the economist for the White House just said on CNN last night, then Medicaid would cover 94 million patients. The healthcare exchanges would stay about the same, but employer and sponsored insurance would go down from about 163 million to 128 million, and would have as many as 40 million uninsured. This, is, is really a tragedy and a real crisis. 
So one of the things that people are talking about is that maybe there needs to be insurance reform. It was always a concept that you needed skin in the game, deductibles and co-pays to encourage wellness. But skin in the game discourages patients from getting tested for COVID-19. So in a way, it encourages spread of the disease. So will the pandemic lead to insurance reform? And the Nobel Prize winning economist that's written so much about deaths of despair has said one thing we should do is get rid of the linkage between healthcare insurance and employment. That in 2019, employer-based insurance costs companies $21,000 for a family, about $7,200 for a single person. That causes wages to stagnate or fall and some jobs to be outsourced to jobs without benefits because they're cheaper. And this Nobel Prize winning economist, we'll see on the next slide, has described this as employer-based insurance as a wrecking ball, destroying market for less educated workers and contributing to the rise of death of despair. So states medic payments to Medicaid, remember Medicaid's a, a matching grant from states and the feds. Medicaid's gone up from 20% in 2008 to 29% in 2019. And if the states don't have money, uh, they have to spend the money on Medicaid, then they don't have money for roads, universities, police, firefighters, uh, K through 12, federal budget deficit rises, the pandemic causes job loss, which then uh, creates health insurance loss. A Angus Deaton is the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist from Princeton. And then about costs, um, now the government has said they're gonna pay all costs of testing and treatment for uninsured people with COVID. They've made that quite clear. But in Time Magazine, they said that Danny Askinney uh, didn't go to the hospital, but had three trips to the ER, tested positive and was quite sick. She ended up getting a bill for $34,927.43. Kaiser Family Foundation thinks an uncomplicated case with private insurance would run about $9,700, a complicated case about $20,000. Uh, another source said the uninsured with a six-day hospitalization would be $73,000. We have some colleagues in Philadelphia who have been hospitalized for three or four weeks on a vent, and the cost of those will be a, a lot. So back to, that was kind of healthcare in the future, but now I think we need to take a little bit of a broader view and try to figure out that healthcare is part of the larger economy and can we learn anything from history? And if we think about history, pandemics have created large unexpected changes in society in history and the economy. The first pandemic that we've identified was in 541 in Egypt. We now know that it was caused by Yersinia pestis, the bubonic plague. It didn't burn out till 750, so it went 200 years. A historian at the time said over 10,000 people a day died. And even the emperor Justinian in Constantinople contracted the disease, but he recovered. But what was interesting, the changes that happened because of this pandemic was Justinian had just reconquered Italy and most of the Western Mediterranean and was just about to reunite the Western Roman Empire with the Eastern Roman Empire. The plague hit, that didn't work out, and it certainly led to the fall of the Byzantine Empire. The Black Death we all know about was in Europe from 1347 to 1351. It killed a third of the population of Europe. It started in Asia. And again, pandemics usually, as you look at history, governments react slowly. There's a lot of conspiracy theories. You usually blame the outsider. And um, it's, it's really a, a grim situation. In the pandemic uh, of the Black Death, they blamed the Jews and the Jews of Strasbourg were told to convert to Christianity or die. Half of them converted, the rest were rounded up and taken to the Jewish cemetery and burned alive on February 14th, 1349. Now, this pandemic, the Black Death, also had major changes in um, the economy system of Europe. It basically started the end of serfdom in Western Europe by uh, eroding the strict hereditary class system that bound peasants to the land owned by their lords. It also showed a sharp decline in the Catholic Church. And if you read the Decameron, which is the, the classic Italian uh, Black Death novel, much of the, the, the Decameron is um, satirizing nuns and priests doing things that nuns and priests should not be doing. The next pandemic was in 1518 uh, in smallpox with the discovery of the new world by Europeans 
a smallpox epidemic went from Hispaniola to Puerto Rico to what is now Mexico City to the Incan Empire. And in describing this, Alfred Crosby, a historian, said, this is a virgin soil epidemic. And that's what we're having now in the United States and across the world with COVID-19. It's a virgin soil epidemic. And by that, we mean the population has no previous contact with the disease, so it's basically immunologically defenseless, and a lot of people get sick. And another historian has said the discovery of America was followed by possibly the greatest demographic disaster in the history of the world. Now, we, we all know about the 1918 flu pandemic, which happened just uh, after World War I. And that pandemic killed 50 to 100 million people. But it also caused a global financial collapse. The British pound stopped being the preeminent uh, currency in the world. You had a rise of, of totalitarian governments and fascism in Spain and Italy and in Germany. And you had emergence of new economic powers like the USA and China. And then after World War II, you had all these new monetary funds like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the UN, and NATO. And basically that the pandemic in 1918 caused a lot of very big changes in the economy and in governance in Europe. So I think we're ready for the next polling question. I think it's the last one. It asks you, how many people died in one month in America during the pandemic of 1918, the so-called Spanish flu, which did not start in Spain? Okay, so we'll have the poll open for a few. We're running low on time. We're almost done. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close this poll and share. All right, 31% respectively say 500,000 and a million. 20%. Uh, the correct answer is 150,000 died in one month in October in America. Okay. So what does it mean for the economy, the economic up upheaval, the old system fails? So, just like in the healthcare system, which showed us longstanding unaddressed frailties, like our medical record and our CDC test development and our FDA approval of tests, the economy is also showing frailties. This is a period of radical uncertainty and order of magnitude greater than anything we're used to. We all know about globalization, where productions move to the most efficient place, money flows wherever it can be put to highest use. We can jump on an airplane and get some across the world in a day. The pandemic is going to make countries rethink whether they really want to be as reliant as they've been on to other countries for PPE, for ventilators, for drugs. You may see a resurgence of the nation state. We have really fragile supply chains because we didn't have redundancy and resilience. Turns out almost all of the antibiotics in America are made in China. Did you really want to be that dependent on other countries during a pandemic? And th this slide is really important because the pandemic has really created unexpected changes all over the world. And here's just some that I grabbed really quickly. The Financial Times is kind of the Wall Street Journal of the whole world. It actually has more readers than the Wall Street Journal. And if anything, is more conservative than the Wall Street Journal. So a very conservative free market organ. They're now supporting universal basic income and wealth taxes. In a neighborhood in San Salvador, the gangs are saying they don't, they're not going to charge the uh, extortion fees to small business owners and taxi drivers. Maybe more importantly for us, Republicans supported a $2 trillion bill and then another $484 trillion bill with direct cash payments to Americans, paid sick leave, unemployment benefits, student debt relief, help for renters and small businesses. And the federal government has pledged quite publicly they're going to pay all COVID-19 health bills of uninsured Americans by reimbursing providers at Medicare rates. So all of these, you know, paid sick leave has suddenly gone from being something we worry about because um, people are lazy and are going to take advantage of their employers. And now it's, it's like we need to do it because it's going to stop the pandemic. Um, all of these things that was unanimously passed in a GOP-controlled Senate are things the GOP has never been in favor of. And this federal government paying all COVID-19 bills by reimbursing providers at Medicare rates, I had someone ask me yesterday, isn't that Medicare for all? And it kind of looks like it. 
So this is an idea that pandemics create unexpected changes. Denmark is now paying 75 to 90 percent of salaries uh, if the companies don't lay anybody off. Spain's nationalized all their hospitals, and Amsterdam has embraced the donut model, which we'll visit in just a second. So the, the big thing is now that with climate change and the pandemic, you don't want growth. The more growth you have, the worse the climate change. The more growth you have, the worse the pandemic spread. Now, John Maynard Keynes in 1930 predicted that by 2030, we'd have so much capital investment in technology, living standards would be so good that people wouldn't have to work. And he would said the love of money as a possession will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity. Climate change and the pandemic require less growth if you want to control them. Even before the pandemic, there was a degrowth movement that has been saying we want zero or negative GDP growth. So they would be happy with the, the Times headline today that the GDP has decreased 4.8% um, in the first quarter. So a professor in Barcelona has said the faster we produce and consume goods, the more we damage the environment. So some people are saying we need to shift from a mass market production to local services. And the winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2019 said, nothing in either our theory or the data proves that the highest GDP per capita is generally desirable. Now that's something that we've, that's just been taken as a given for the last 80 years since uh, World War II. But economist Kate Raworth of Oxford has talked about the donut model and Amsterdam has just identified this and accepted it as their guide going forward. Here's the donut. In the middle of the donut hole are things that you need, water, food, health, gender equality, networks, housing, political voice, peace. The green part is the donut that you eat. That's the safe space for the economy to do things that you want. If you overshoot and do have too much growth, like you'd want in the past, you have ocean acidification, climate change, air pollution, things that are bad for the, uh, for, the, for the globe. Another theorist has said, so what we need is a different economic mindset. We tend to think of the economy as the way we buy and sell things, mainly consumer goods. And remember, 70% of the US economy is consumer goods, is us buying things. That's why the decrease of 4.8% in the first quarter of GDP is such a staggering number. But that's not what the economy needs to be. At its core, the economy is the way we eat take our resources and turn them into things we need to live. Looked at in this way, we can start to see more opportunities for living differently that allow us to produce less stuff without increasing misery. So we've, he says that for the last 40 years, everybody's agreed that, and that by having everybody agree on the mindset that the market is, the free market is always what delivers a good quality of life and you want growth, so it has to be protected and the market will always return to normal after short periods of crisis. But what some people are saying now is that the, in the top of this, the exchange value is our guiding principle. So that's the free market. And that should be, that's what we've been doing for the last 40 years, is saying the free market is the best thing. You want to increase GDP. You want growth at all costs. What some people are now saying is, gosh, maybe the protection of life should be our guiding economic principle. And then we wouldn't have climate change and we wouldn't have all of the problems that the pandemic has discovered. So geopolitics may lead to previously un impossible policies. We just mentioned the Financial Times is a very right-wing, free market, conservative, very influential organ in Europe. And they, their editorial board has, has written this, which would shock anybody two months ago. As Western leaders learned in the Great Depression after World War II, to demand collective sacrifice, you must offer a social contract that benefits everyone. Today's crisis is laying bare how far many rich societies fall short of the ideal, much as the struggle to contain the pandemic has exposed the unpreparedness of health systems. So the brittleness of many countries' economies has been exposed as governments scramble to stave off bankruptcies and cope with mass unemployment. Remember, we now un unemployment right now is 26.5 million people have filed for unemployment in America. Tomorrow, the numbers will come out. There'll be many more. Radical reforms, these conservatives are saying, reversing the prevailing policy direction of the last four decades will need to be put on the table. Governments will have to accept a more active role in the economy. So the idea that you can have a small government, which is the GOP thing, has now been said you need a government 
for a safety net to make sure we don't all die in a pandemic. They must see public services and investments rather than liabilities and look for ways to make labor markets less insecure. Redistribution will again be on the agenda, the privileges of the elderly and the wealthy in question. Policies until recently considered eccentric, a universal basic income and wealth taxes will have to be in the mix. So I think this is gonna really upend American politics because one of the things that American politics has always thought was that the Republican Party wanted to have small government. Remember Reagan said, government's not the solution, government's the problem. Well, what you're hearing now is that we're all in this together, we have to work together to solve the pandemic. But here's John Poderitz, a, a very intelligent uh, intellectual on the right-hand side of things. If he's talking about the ACA here. If Republicans cannot defend the idea that what is important is the freedom of the individual to make choices about how to live his life, as opposed to the notion that we're all in this together and must all participate in healthcare to ballast each other's healthcare outcomes, then we've accepted an essential social democratic principle, and that's a huge concession. I don't just take it from me that the Republicans have lost this argument. Steve Bannon yesterday said, the era of Robert Taft limited government conservatism, it's just not relevant. It's not relevant anymore. So I think that you might see some very big changes in healthcare policy going forward. Another big thing that's happened is the United States is not being part of the debate. It's off the map. The absence of US political leadership in the pandemic has struck people in Europe as, as, as disappointing. Um, one guy in, in the Institute Montong has said, America has not done badly, it's done exceptionally badly. Has America become the wrong kind of power with the wrong kind of priorities? China also is losing face internationally because they're pursuing wolf warrior diplomacy. That's named after two jingoistic action films I'm sure all of you have seen in the original Chinese. They're admitting no mistakes, controlling the flow of information, and saying that the Communist Party's been totally successful. Um, let's, for the moment of time, we're going to have to skip over a few things and go to how do we prevent the next pandemic? Dangerous viruses are those that jump into humans from other species. There's 1.6 million potentially zoonotic viruses that could do this. We've identified fewer than 1%. NEPA, HEDRA, Marburg, Ebola, HIV, HANTA. A guy just did a study a couple of years ago in rural China and Wuhan. 3% of the people there had antibodies to bat coronaviruses. That means, according to him, between a million and seven million uh, people in Asia have already picked up coronaviruses that are novel. These things are spilling over at an incredible rate as part of everyday business in rural China. PREDICT is a biological surveillance and predictive modeling that was ended the program in September 2019. Why? These projects cost money. They don't necessarily seem like they're producing much in the short term. So they're the easiest things to cut when you want to cut a budget. The NIH and the NSF get $47 billion, which is 7% of the Depart Department of Defense budget, $686 billion. I think and others think that we need to rethink about pandemics the same way that we think of terrorism. This pandemic has killed a lot more Americans than any terrorist attack could possibly. And so some people are saying we should spend a billion dollars and identify 70% of these potential problem viruses that might jump from bats and cause a pandemic. The Gates Foundation is, is doing a lot to support uh, trying to find a, a positive antiviral from 14,000 compounds, and the pharmaceutical companies are, are really doing a good job of cooperating. That Richard Hackett guy we talked about, he leads the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovations. And so there are people saying that we need to be ready for the next pandemic. And that is all I have. I wanted to say the take home messages. Pandemics are followed by large unexpected changes in society, the economy and history. We should invest as much in pandemic prevention as we do terrorism prevention and defense. The world economy may have to change its guiding principle to deal with pandemics and climate change. Large unexpected policy shifts may occur in the USA. Healthcare will have to change and it should not go back to the status quo of how things were done before the COVID-19 epidemic. And it will take a lot longer for pandemics to subside than most people think. We've talked about the references. They're here. Thomas Puyo is brilliant. 
Um, if you follow Eric Topper, Andy Slavik, Scott Gottlieb, and Bob Walkner, you will be up to date. And it's very important to stay up to date on this. And it's exactly 3.30, so let's stop there. Oh, okay, Kent, uh, thank you. An enormous uh, round of applause from all of us here for taking a complicated subject with many different reference points and consolidating it into a, a 90 minute talk. We are incredibly uh, grateful to you for doing so for all of us. We received a number of questions, which we don't have time right now to answer, but uh, what we do uh, uh, commit to for our attendees is that we will send out the webinar link along with the questions and answers. We'll post those to, uh, to Kent after this webinar and get his uh, responses. Uh, with a link to our resources, as well as a post-webinar survey, which we request that you complete for us to allow us uh, to continue to provide these types of targeted webinars uh, to you, our clients and uh, faculty for the future. So thank you very, very much. Uh, I think we have one last polling question 